God bless you. You may be seated if you can. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. How many knows that in ministry you just got to roll with the punches, right? If you didn't know that, now you've learned that. <laughs> I got a text early this morning that says, well, Leslie's going to, I mean, not Leslie, excuse me, Joanne's going to be gone, and then Derek's sick, and Heather's not going to be able to be here. So now what do we do? I said, well, I guess I'll do it. So the fourth string pulled in. So we're going to have to come up with a fifth and sixth string. So if you can play piano, guess what? We're going to need your help. But uh, anyways, I thank God for these guys. Make sure you grab a bulletin before you leave so that you know everything that's going on uh, here at the church. We want to make sure that you are you are up to date on all the activities. Hey, I just want to say a huge congratulations to these three young people you, Win First Assembly, need to be proud of our students that went to nationals. They did a great job. <clears throat> Micah got an excellent rating on his uh, drama solo and did a fantastic job. Rachel did. She got an excellent rating on her uh, American Sign Language solo and did a fantastic job. And Kaylee got a superior rating uh, on her short sermon. So uh, these guys did fantastic. They represented Win First Assembly well. And uh, all of our Arkansas kids, we've had several Arkansas students got number one in the nation in their category. And so it was fantastic. So thank you guys for praying and for supporting these young people today. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to First Peter chapter 1. We're going to read verses 5 through 9 there. And then when you have found 1 Peter chapter 1, put your finger there, and we're going to jump over to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. So 1 Peter chapter 1. Then we're going to look at 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And when you have that, stand if you, uh, stand, if you will, in honor of the reading of the word of the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 says this, Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that this inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Turn over to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. We're going to read verse 18 through 27, a very familiar portion of Scripture. This is what the Scripture says. Now the angel of the Lord had commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and, and raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. He turned and saw the angel and his four sons who were with him hid themselves. As David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out from the threshing floor and paid homage to David with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, Give me this side of the threshing floor that I may build on it an altar to the Lord. Give it to me at its full price that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Ornan uh, said to David, Take it and let the Lord, the king, do with what seems good to him. See, I give the oxen for burnt offering and the threshing sledges for the wood and the wheat for the grain offering. I give it all. But David said to Ornan, No, but, it, but I will buy them for the full price. I will not take for it. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, nor offer burnt offering that costs me nothing. So David paid Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight 
for the site. And David built the alt there an altar to the Lord and the presented burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord. And the Lord answered him with fire from heaven upon the altar of the burnt offering. Then the Lord commanded the angel and he put his sword back into his sheath. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Give me clarity of thought this day, Lord. Give me energy in my body and my vocal cords that I may speak this message with passion and zeal under the Holy Spirit. Father, I come against every attack of the enemy that has come upon this day. And we rebuke it and we say distractions go in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you that we're going to meet you here in this altar. And we give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' glorious name. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I'm continuing my series on the crucible, the preparation of faith. Let me remind you that what a crucible is, the, de the, the definition of a crucible is a container of metal or refractory uh, material employed for heating substances to high temps, a severe or a severe searching test or trial. We've been talking about how that God uses seasons and moments of our lives to prepare our faith, to get us ready for the greater things that God has in store for our lives. We've, we've gone through a journey the last couple of weeks and seeing how there are different ways crucibles come into our lives. You see, with Elijah, his crucible came through life circumstances. Do you realize that God can speak to us through the circumstances of life, society, uh, issues that are taking place. God can use these to, to hedge away the things within our lives and the church's lives that, that needs to be purified so that God can mold us and make us into what he wants us to be so that we can allow his glory and his presence to flow through us. So Elijah had this when it came to the drought and went to the widow's house there at Zarephath and that God provided supernaturally through, through the meal and the oil that was continually to be placed before them and God spoke to him through the circumstances. Last week we talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and that they came through their season of crucible because of choosing to serve the Lord. Listen, how many knows that when you choose to stand up for what God says is right, the enemy will always put pressure on you. And it's through those seasons of when the enemy begins to put pressure in your life that God begins to use the, 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 the trials and the tribulation that the enemy wants to bring in your life because you're choosing to follow God versus following the ways of the world. God will use that pressure cooker to mold you into the person that he wants to use you for his glory. And now we find ourselves with King David. King David has found himself in a very unique crucible moment. And it came because he sinned. God will use your sin moments, the moments that you fell into temptation, to allow, we call it punishment, but what it is is it's God's redempting power to bring you into a relationship with him and to purify you and to mature your life. Let me give you a back story if you're not familiar with this scripture. At the beginning of of First Chronicles chapter 21, we see that David is being enticed by the enemy of our souls to number the people. He took a census, and against the, the advice of Joab and all of his advisors, he went ahead and had a census drawn, and as the census was completely done, and they found out how many fighting men there were in, in, in Israel and in Judea, and, and, and Judah, the Bible says that there was something that took place in David's heart that he knew that he had messed up. Aren't you thankful for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit? That when we mess up, that we can be quickened just in that moment to make things right. The Bible tells us that in that moment, God spoke to God, David's seer, and he gave a word. He says, David, because you have chosen to go after your own plans and your own ways, I'm going to give you a choice of three punishments. These three judgments, you're going to have to choose. One of them was that, that there will be a drought and, and a famine in the earth or in the land for three years. The other one would be for three months, you're going to be running from your enemies. 
Or the last one was, for three days there's going to be a plague that comes upon your people. And the Bible says that David came with, with fear and trembling unto the Lord. He knew that he had messed up, and he, he told, the, to, told the seer God, he said, tell the Lord that I want to be in his hands because I know he's a merciful God. And the Bible tells us that God chose to put a plague on the, earth, uh, uh, on the people of Israel for three days, and, and it was a death plague, and over 70,000 people died because David chose to allow sin into his heart which brings us to a moment how many knows that if your choices and your actions would bring consequences to someone else that was would be d dire just like death of his people wouldn't you want to get on your face before god god's got your attention god is trying to do something perfect and pure in your life my friends we need to listen to the word of the lord today and we need to glean from david's mistakes so that we don't make the same mistakes or that when we're going through our crucible moments because of our sins we can learn from david the first thing I want to share with you this morning was this, that David, David's sin that caused this crucible to unfold. You see, pride was the core reason that David sinned. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1 and 2 says, Then Satan stood against Israel and incited, he and tempted David to number Israel. So, so David said to Joab, the commander of the army, Go number Israel for Beersheba to Dan and bring me a report that I may know their number. He wanted to see how big the kingdom had gotten under his reign. He wanted to see how powerful of an army that David had. Let me remind you, David was a military man. He was a man that went and conquered and slayed. He was a brilliant uh, general. He was a brilliant strategist when it came to war. And, and he, he was a man that actually heard the voice of the Lord. And when God said go and he went, listen, he was a powerful army leader. And so David wanted to see how big his army is. And that caused pride to rise up in his heart. How many remembers what the scripture says happens after pride comes? A fall. Pride comes before a fall, and God knew that. God knew that if he allowed pride to continue to stay in David's heart, that eventually the people would fall, that David would fall. How come? God knew that in this season of tribulation, that if he didn't get a hold of David's heart, that so is the leader's heart goes the people's heart. Think about that. Whatever the leader is that's before us, and we see that in our own society right now, if there is a righteous president, guess what? Things begin to go the way of, 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 of the Scripture and the way of God. But when we have a wicked president that doesn't love the Lord and that doesn't adhere to the Scripture, guess what? We have calamity. We have issues. The morality of, of society begins to plummet. My friends, whatever the heart of the leader is, the people goes thereafter. And so God had to get David's attention. Why? Because David was known to be a man after God's own heart. David was said that, that God, I, I want what you have. I'm not perfect by any means. And how many knows David was not perfect? He was not perfect committed adultery he, he he committed murder to try to cover up that adultery and, and and because of all this stuff i mean god god said but listen i can use david david's heart is malleable david's heart is something that i can use and so he's had a man after my own heart god knew that if i could just get a hold of david if i could get just get a hold of david i could win the hearts of the people you see the people love david so much they loved him so much that they even, they, they even wrote a song. I'll know that you really love me when you start writing songs about me. But the Bible says they wrote a song about King David, that they said that Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. And it was that very song of endearment and, and love towards King David that got Saul's jealousy riled up so that he began to pursue David and to try to kill David. But they loved him. They loved David. They, if David was going to be their king and David was going to march off the cliff, guess where they were going? They were going to march off with David. Why? Because they loved their king. They love their leader, and God knew how much they love their leader. And God said, i got to have a king on the throne of Israel that's going to follow after me. i got to have a king whose heart's going to be pure. And so to protect the people of God, God brought David. 
to a point so that he can work on his pride through a crucible. See, when it came time for the crucible moment, God gave David these three, these three choices that I share. But what I love about David is that he trusted in the mercies of God rather than the wisdom of man. David could have easily tried to whistle his way out of this, this, this judgment moment, this crucible moment. But the Bible says that in, 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 in the 21st chapter of 1 Chronicles chapter 13, he says, Then David said to God, I am in great distress. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is very great. My friends, when you're going through your crucible moment, trust God with the process. Trust God with the process. Why? Because he's full of mercy. He's full of grace. How many knows that all things work together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose? And if you love him, and how many knows he loves us, that no matter what we go through, whether it be through the fire, whether it be through the flood, whether it be through drought, whether it be through famine, God's got his hand on you. He, he may be trying to put the pressure cooker in your life, the crucible moment. He may turn up the heat in your life. But if he begins to turn up the heat in your life, he is going to make sure that you are taken care of in the midst of that moment. And he is going to bring those impurities to the top so that he can remove those things so that you can be strong and malleable and you can be used for his glory. Trust the process. When I was going through my crucible moment, my, my three and a half years of anxiety and depression, I literally, I asked God if, <laughs> come on now, how many knows that this is kind of silly, but this is where I was. I said, God, do you know what you're doing? How many's ever asked that question? God, do you even know what you're doing? And you know what the answer is? Yes. Yes, I know what I'm doing. Because his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And if his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, oh, my friends, I just think we need to trust in the mercies of God. We need to be just like David and says, listen, I don't trust my own foolishness because everything that I can do will bring, uh, bring a destruction to my life. I'm going to put my hands in God and let the process speak. And how many knows that when we go through the process, God is beginning to teach us what we need to know. And so when there is revelation, when there is revelation of what God is trying to do in our lives through the season of, of a crucible moment, those trials and tribulations, and we have this revelations, my friends, we need to repent. We need to go through seasons of repentance. Especially when our crucible moment has been brought on because of our sin and our rebellion. And when we go through a season of repentance, guess what? The refining process that God is doing in your life will take root. We see that David repented in verse 8 of our text. The Bible says that David said to God, I have sinned greatly in the thing that I have, uh, that I have done, but now please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have acted very foolishly. How many has ever been there before? God, I've acted foolishly. And because of my foolishness, I need you to take care of me. I need you to forgive me. Oh, God. And when the judgment began to come, the, the, the repentance actually went into a whole nother level. In verse 17 of our text, he says, And David said to God, Was it not I who commanded to number the people? Is it I who have sinned and done great evil? But these sheep have done. What, what have they done? Please let your hand, O oh Lord my God, be against me and against my father's house. But do not let the plague be on your people. He, he took it another foot. He took ownership. He took ownership of his sin. He took ownership of his pride. And he knew that the crucible that he was going through was because of himself. And so he repented. Can I give you this disclaimer this morning? That if you have revelation of why you're going through your crucible moment. Why you're going through your trials and your tribulation and God brings this to light and you choose not to repent from it. Because how many knows God's not going to make you do something? You have to have a choice. If you choose not to repent and learn your ways that God is trying or learn the ways that God is trying to teach you, you might 
have to do the crucible over in a different season. Now, I, I realized there were times when I was growing up, it was time for a test. And y'all know, I did not study one bit. That was more the case than not. I was not a study. And, and, and when I did study, young people, don't do what Pastor Matt did. I crammed it as I was going down to the classroom. There's times I stuck it up to my face and said, by osmosis, come into my brain. And it didn't happen. And I failed miserably. I and mean, when the teacher came and was beginning to pass back out our test grades, I, there was just a part of me going, oh, Lord, I believe in divine intervention. I believe. And, and, and I get that page, and I was doing this and crossing my fingers and crossing my toes and crossing my eyes, and I was praying the sinner's prayer all at the same time, declaring the glories and victories of God. And I got an F on that paper. God, you have forsaken me. <laughs> No, you just didn't learn your lesson. You didn't hear the teacher when she was teaching or when he was teaching. And because I did not listen, I failed the test. But when it came time for the grades being passed out, I was thankful for a teacher that was full of mercy. And says, guess what? We're going to retake this test. Yes. Sometimes... If we don't repent and learn of our ways, we've got to retake the test. And sometimes, well, it's like this. When, I, when it came time for us to start doing um, driver's tests, we had this guy that was a state trooper. He had a flat top. I mean, you remember the old, that old 50 flat top? He had a flat top hairdo and just was massively tall and just built. I mean, he was just built different than most people. And here I am, this little scrawny 14-year-old that's trying to get his permit, and I'm looking at this state trooper, and he just growls at me, what do you want? I want to take the test. <laughs> he gives me the Scantron and my test, and, and, and I don't know, they had four different, they had A test, B test, C test, D test, so you couldn't look at your neighbor and cheat. So he gave me my test, and I would go over there, and I would start, to, oh, yeah, I got this, and I start bubbling it in, and I go, and I take it to him, and he looks at it, and he says, you failed. Come back in a week. So I would come back in a week, and guess what? I said, I want to take the test again, and he gave me a different test. Same concepts, but different questions. And I, my confident 14-year-old self began to take that test again. And I take it up to that state trooper. He slashed through it. You failed. Come back and see me again in a week. Then he gave me the easy test. Because I'd already gone through it twice. I knew the material. I took it the third time and I, I passed it with flying colors. Why? Because I had to go through a learning process. What if what if I had got it right the first time? I would have been well on my way of practicing how to drive on the streets and use the vehicle that my parents had allotted to me to use. My friends, God wants you to learn and pass the test the first time. Because even though you may go through the test a second time, it's not going to be exactly the same way. It might be just a tad harder so God could get your attention. But we have to learn. We have to learn our tests the first time. So my friends, there are times in our lives that God uses our sinful rebellion and the punishment thereof to, to purify us and to refine us and allow the crucibles to come in our lives. The second thing that I want to bring to your attention this morning is this, that it was David's obedience. First it was David's sin that brought the crucible, but it was David's obedience that brought a greater depth of worship to his life. You see, David found himself with a road, a, a way of escape, a victory of this trial. We see it in our, in our uh, text in verse 18. He says, Now the angel of the Lord commanded God to say to David that David should go up and arise to the altar, uh, uh, to uh, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. 
Here's a way out for David. David had repented of his sins. He said, oh God, I'm the one that sinned. It wasn't these people that had sinned. And the Bible says that when the death plagued angel got to Jerusalem, he was getting ready to slay Jerusalem, that God said, hold on. And when David cried out to God in that moment, something took place. God gave him a way. He says, something has changed in David's heart. You see, for all we know, that this could have been the last day of three days, or it could have been the first day of the three days. I don't know where it was in this three-day period of, of the death plague coming upon the people of Israel, but what we do know is that David learned his lesson. Your crucible moments can be a, a year, it could be a day. I, it doesn't matter. God will do whatever he can to get your moment, but it was in this moment he found a road to victory. So David saw that he had overcame uh, the, the, this crucible. He, 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 he conquered the reason why he was going through this in the first place. How did he know? How did he know that he had learned his lesson? We find it in verse 23 and 24. Is that when he got up from his throne, he went to Ornan's house, and the Bible says that when Ornan said to David, he says, take it and let my Lord the king do what seems good to him. See, I, have, I, I give the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges for the wood and the wheat for the grain offering. I give it all. He says, it's not going to cost you one thing. Here it is, King David. But David said to Ornan, no, I will buy them from, for, for you from full price. And I will not take for... What the, uh, excuse me, I will not take for the Lord what is yours, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. It was in this moment David knew that he got the, the answers right. He knew that he got the test right. Why? Because David was allowed once again to allow his position to afford him privileges. David could have easily gone to Ornan's house and Ornan began to, to say to King David, David, here's the, here's the bull, here's the wood for the offering, here, uh, here, here for the sacrifice, here is the, the grain for the peace offering. I'm going to give it all to you because you're my king. And, and, and here, I'm going to even give you the threshing floor. This place belongs now to you. And David, by his kingship, could have easily said, that's right, I am the king. I'm going to take ownership of this. Why? Because I am the king, and, 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 and I, I, I appreciate your, 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 your being so kind to the king. He could have easily said that. But David understood that what got him in this place in the first place was his pride. And so how do we know he learned his lesson? He said, no, I'm going to buy it from you. I'm going to buy it from you. Because David understood that our crucible moments are costly. But what creates a greater depth in our worship is understanding how costly our trials are to our lives. You see, verse 24 and 25 says that David said to Ornan, No, I'm going to buy it from you for full price, for I cannot take, what, uh, take to the Lord what is yours, nor offer a burnt offering that costs me nothing. So the Bible says, So that David gave him 600 shekels of gold by weight for that sight. It was a costly lesson that he had to learn, but my friends, it was in that moment he understood that his worship was worth it when you go through your trials guess what your worship better have some depth to it when you go through your crucible moments and you've passed them your your worship is going to go to a whole nother level have you ever been in those seasons where when when you begin to talk sing about the victory of the lord and how he set you free and and you sung it in one moment and you're like oh that sounds good oh that's such a good song all oh, the writers did so good all oh, the band is playing it just right today that oh bless the lord yes he set me free and then you go through a moment where you are bound you go through a moment where where you needed victory and all of a sudden those words have a little bit different meaning 
when you were bound by drugs, when you were bound by alcohol, when you were bound by pornography, when you were bound from lust and you were bound by the things of this world and God comes in and sets you free, when all of a sudden He set me free, yes, He set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. They take a whole new level of meaning. A whole new level of meaning. I know I share this a lot when it comes to worship, but there was a guy at, at, at Stephanie's home church, Brother Yaunt, and, and Brother Yaunt would get, oh, he would get so excited about when we would sing that old song, When the Saints Go Marching In, When the Saints Go Marching In, oh, when the saints go marching in. Yes, I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching in. And every time I saw that on the playlist, you know what I would do? I would roll my eyes. Here I am playing the piano. Oh, when the saints go marching in. And I just, I literally, I, they probably saw me just doing this. But Brother Yaunt had a different feeling about that song. Because when we start singing that song, Brother Yaunt would, he, he, he was, I don't know what, 80 something, 90, I think he was, and he was putting on siding on houses, just a, uh, just a feeble old man, and he just, but he would come down and he would do this. And just march around the altar. And of course, when he got to going, everybody else got to going. And when everybody else got to going, I said, well, I guess I better join them. Because I don't want to be left out of this Jericho march. And he would, and everybody would say, Brother Yacht, why do you get so happy when we start singing when the saints go marching in? He said, because I remember when I was not a saint. I remember when I was contrary to the word of God. I remember when I was not part of the family of God. And then I gave my heart over to the Lord. And when I gave my heart over to the Lord, I became part of the sainthood. I became part of the family of God. And there is coming a day that I'm going to go marching in. Why? Because I have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of my testimony. And I get excited because I've overcome the Lamb by the word of the Lamb, by, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. And he says, I get excited and I can't help but respond in worship. Listen, when you've gone through your crucible moments, your worship should go to a different level. It should. It should. It's, something should take place. Uh, when you begin to lift your voice and you begin to sing, and w listen, let your praise come forth. Why? Because your crucible moment cost you something. How many of you, 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 you get a, a nice new vehicle and you just park it in the garage? And then you get your old ratty vehicle and keep driving around town. But you got a brand new vehicle and it's parked in the garage. I don't know one person that does that. If you get something new and flashy and, 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 and valuable, what do you do? You, you parade it around. You take it and you drive it. And, and now, now you might park it in the very far parking spot at Walmart while you're going to go shop, but you got it there. You want people to see it. I took... Rachel to the mall this past week down in, in Florida. She goes, Dad, we went to the outlet mall. See, that's my kind of shopping, outlet mall. She wanted to go to a real mall. So I took her to a real mall, an indoor mall. And we went to this indoor mall and we parked. And here we are in this Buick, nice Buick that my wife drives, and we park it right in front of a Porsche. Gorgeous baby blue Porsche. Rachel's like, ooh, and I'm like, ooh. And we start walking in the parking lot, and we're seeing nicer vehicles and bigger vehicles and shiny vehicles, and we're like, wow, Florida must be nice. We get into this mall. I'm talking, it is a high-end Gucci and all these other, I mean, it is these big, flat, fancy names that I... Poor Rachel, she started, she really wanted to shop and she went and started looking at some of the price tags and we were seeing price tags of small stuff that I could get at Walmart for, you know, 20 bucks and they were like 190 bucks. She goes, oh, dad. She goes, well, where's the Forever 21? Where are the other, you know? I said, baby, they're back at the outlet malls. They're back at the outlet malls. So guess what we did? We walked back in the parking lot, back by all those nights. We looked at that Porsche again going, ooh, got into our Buick, and we went to the outlet malls. That's our kind of shopping, ain't it, Ray? It is. But 
someone that gets all that Gucci and they get all that uh, Louis Vuitton and they get all, they don't keep it into the closet. Guess what they do? They wear it with pride. Why? Because it's valuable. There's something flashy and shiny. Listen, when God has done something in your life, wear it. And you're not showing off of how good you are. What you're doing is you're showing it off how good your God is. Don't go through the crucible moment and waste it. Because it costs you a lot. It costs you a lot. Worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let it rise from the earth to the heavens and let it be a sweet aroma in the nose of our God. That's what he longs for. Because when you begin to let your worship go to a whole other level because of what you've been through, the world that sits around you, you remember last week we talked about that when you go through your crucible moments, you're going to live it publicly so that the world can see who Jesus is. Well, when you begin to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords and how he's had mercy and how he had grace on your life and he's helped you and you've learned the lesson and you got the big old fat A and you're wanting to put it on the refrigerator of your life, my friends, you need to lift up the name of the Lord most high for he is faithful even when we are not faithful and he is good even when we are not good are you hearing me today so that the whole world can know that he is faithful when they're not faithful and that he is good when they're not good there should be a whole new depth to your worship and it should be because it's costly but finally I want to bring this to your attention you see David's crucible moment it was David's investment that propelled his desire for God so that the next generation could experience him too. Think about this. Your crucible moment is not just for you. I want you to marinate on that for a moment. Your crucible moment is not just for you. You see, David realized that because he grew through this time, of testing, that the very spot that he was standing was valuable. First Chronicles chapter 20, verse 28 says this, At that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him, at the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, he sacrificed there. David saw that there was something special about that spot. That after he had purchased that spot, that threshing floor place, that the Bible tells us that he would go back there to worship, to communicate with God. He would go back there. Why? Because there was something valuable about that spot. What was valuable about that spot that he had an encounter with God? It was where the fire of God fell. Come on now. Verse 26 of that same chapter says, And David built there an altar to the Lord and presented burnt offerings and peace offerings, and he called on the name of the Lord. How many times have you have brought stuff to the Lord and you begin to allow your offerings and your praise and your glory and, and, and call upon the Lord? How many times have you come to him? But the Bible says in the same verse, it says, And the Lord answered him with fire from heaven upon the altar of the burnt offering. It was in that moment that the fire of God fell. How many times do we go running back to where the fire fell in our lives? How many times do we get to that place where we realize that God answered us by fire and we touched him and we heard from him, my friends? We look at fire sometimes to be a signal of God's judgment. And yes, the fire of God, which is bringing the crucible moments for your life to turn up the heat in your lives, there is fire in that moment. But I also want you to realize this as well, that fire can be an indication of God's acceptance on you. How do we know this? I, I've got three, three, three instances. In Judges chapter 6, verse 21, we see that Gideon is being commissioned to lead the people of Israel into victory. And Gideon's sitting here going, God, how do I know that I'm the right man? You, you remember this, Gideon's fleece? He began to give all these fleece. And the angel of the Lord said, greetings, Gideon, mighty man of valor. And, and, and Gideon's going, who, who, me? 
When he realized that he was in the presence of the angel of the Lord, the Bible says, he said, I'm going to tell the angel to, to hold off. He says, will you wait right here while I prepare a meal for you? And the angel says, yes, I'll wait. And so he went and he cooked a goat. And then he took some, some flour and he baked a bread and he took some broth and he, he boiled the broth so that he could present this to the angel of the Lord. And the Bible says that the angel of the Lord told Gideon to put it on the rock. He says, I want you to put the meat on the rock, uh, and I want you to put the bread on the rock, and I want you to pour out the broth upon it. And so Gideon did exactly what the angel of the Lord said. And the Bible says that the angel of the Lord with his staff went and touched the sacrifice. And the Bible says that flames consumed it. Where did the fire come from? It came from God. God accepted, and it was in that moment that Gideon understood that he had been accepted by God. Elijah is standing on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal, and he's saying, the God that answers by fire is the true God. And the, the prophets of Baal begin to try to call down fire from heaven from, from their God. And, and all day he got nothing. And all of a sudden the Bible says when it came to the time of sacrifice, Elijah said, it's my turn. And he began to prepare the altar. He put the sacrifice on the altar and then three times he dumped water upon it so that it came to a place where it began to fill a trench around it and he simply prayed a simple prayer oh god let these people see that you are the true god answer by fire and the bible says that when god saw that the sacrifice was acceptable that fire came down and consumed it licked it all up and now we see in the same moment that David is having a God moment where he allowed the, 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 he bought the threshing floor and built an altar to the Lord and created a burnt offering and a peace offering and he put it on there and the Bible said that God answered by fire. Why? Because God was pleased what took place. When you have gone through your crucible moments and you have allowed the worship to come from your inner beings of those moments of the pain and the struggles that you have gone and you have offered it up to God, my friends, I challenge you today, let God answer you by fire. I don't know about you, but I say, God, do it again. When the people were, when the children of Israel were up in the upper room, guess what God did? He answered by fire. Why? He accepted what was taking place in that place. The assemblies of God was born. It was born in the fires of revival. Oh, God, do it again. Do it again. I don't know about you, but I want the fire of God to burn bright in when first assembly of God again. Send revival, oh, Lord. Do it again, oh, God. Don't just do it for me, but do it for the generations to come. How many of you have heard me preach this before? We've got to, if we're going to have a Pentecostal church that's full of the supernatural and the power of God, guess what we've got to have on a regular basis? The fire of God. Why? So the next generation can experience the power of God. So then the, if you want your, grand, your children, your grandchildren to experience the Pentecostal power like you experienced, then my friends, we've got to let our praise begin to rise on the altars of our hearts, on the threshing floors of our hearts, so that God can send the fire. But guess what? It was in this very place where generations to come would come to experience the glory of the, in, in a powerful way. You see, in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, we see now that there's a new king. David has gone on. He's already gone to be with the Lord. And the Bible says, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord, the temple in Jerusalem, on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David his father at the very place that David ha uh, had appointed on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Think about that. It was the crucible moment that David was going through that brought him to a place where he costly bought the threshing floor of Ornan. And it was in that place, David says, this is where the temple of the Lord is going to be built. And there are traditions that believe it was that very threshing floor. Listen to me, threshing floors are not pleasing. We think of threshing floor as a good thing. Y'all remember back when I preached on the harvest and I preached a message on the threshing floor? The threshing floor was the moment that really brought the true harvest to light. It's what separated the wheat from the chaff. 
It was the process of beating so that the chaff would begin to waste away and the true harvest would come into fruition. It was in that place that David says the threshing floor is a, is a practical place. It is a, it's a powerful place. This is where the fire of God, and he says, I want the temple to sit right here. And they believe, there are traditions that believe that it was in that, that threshing floor was where the Ark of the Covenant would come to rest in the temple. That the mercy seat that was constantly appealed to on the Day of Atonement, that they would throw blood on it and, and make an atonement for the people of Israel every year. It was in that moment, it was in that place where God sat and dwelt among His people. My friends, the place that you purchased because of your crucible will be the place where your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren will have an encounter with the glory of God. Your crucible moment is so valuable you don't understand. We look a little bit further in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, that after Solomon had built the, com uh, completely built the temple, this is what the Bible says in verse 13. It says, and it was the duty of the trumpeters and the singers to make themselves heard in unison in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the songs was raised, when they had lifted up the praises with the trumpets and the cymbals and all the other musical instruments and praise to the Lord, they began to sing, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The Bible says that the house of the Lord was filled with the cloud. It was filled with the Shekinah glory so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. It was in that place, the threshing floor of Ornan, the place that David says this is the place where I'm having an encounter with God so that this place would be a valuable place so that kids and generations coming after me can have an encounter with God oh my friends when first assembly of God you've been through the crucible you've been through heartache you've been through trials you've been through splits you've been through death you've been through good times and the bad times don't let that costly crucible go to waste plow down let the worship rise by that place that says this place is a holy place is a sacred place so that the generations coming after me can experience the glory of God God wants to do something in this church but we got to get back to the altar we got to get back to it it's costly it's costly don't waste that which you've invested for the next generation don't waste it don't waste it. I don't know about you, but I want the glory. I want the glory. Is it going to look like what it did there at the temple? I don't know, but I sure would like it to be that way. I want the power of God to be so real that we can't even stand to minister. I want it to be so, so powerful that people's hearts cannot help but change. Listen, don't waste your crucible moment. There's something at stake. What's at stake? The harvest is at stake. What's at stake? The next generation's at stake. Oh, y'all hearing me today? I'm feeling the power of the Holy Spirit in this place. He's wanting to do something in your life. Sister Renee, would you come to the piano for me? So thankful for this dear lady. You just play softly. I think I left it on. If I didn't, Adam, help her, okay? <clears throat> Hear me today. God wants to relight the fire in you again. He's wanting your threshing floor, your crucible moment to have value for the next generation. Let it happen. Please don't leave. Please stay and dig in and go after God because I believe with every ounce of my being that God set this in order. I believe with all my heart God set this in order. How do I know? This is a whole other teaching in itself.
when the apostolic sets something in order, the prophetic always confirms it. Holly, if you'll come up here for me real quick. I've got the orange mic. As I was leaving this church last night to go back home to get some rest after preparing for this message, I get a text. Holly shared with me that the Lord had given her a word for the big church, the church of Jesus Christ, but also there's a part in that that word that's unique and special to win First Assembly of God. As I began to read it, I said, oh Lord, this is a major part of my message, so I feel that it's in order for her to give this word. So will you receive this word with an open heart today? as individuals, as a church body, and as a nation. We will have to forgive those who wronged us and who hated us because of Christ. There are souls that are going to turn into Paul's with the church's heart of forgiveness. Why is this so timely? Because mass exposure is coming out on all levels. The snakes are being revealed, hiding places, being swept away. Woe to the church leaders who have done evil and wickedness to their sheep, who have stolen funds, raped and molested their children, have been greedy and sought to financially gain through manipulation of the sheep. Woe to those who have advocated for abortion and called themselves followers of Christ. Now is the time where your crimes against humanity will be exposed in the public eye and unto your own heart. And when your heart is exposed to you, the Lord says, do not be ashamed because it is my love that is reaching your heart. Do not feel guilty for if you repent, you will be washed as white as snow. The souls will be coming into your church and they will walk out Paul's. The Spirit of the Lord will hover over your worship. Prepare your hearts. Families will be restored after years of bitterness is uncovered. My church has not yet learned how to forgive the offenses brought against them, but my love will touch the church in a way that has never been felt before, and their hearts will melt in my presence. The people of God will be radically changed forever. When first assembly, you have been called my threshing floor. Once again, I have called you into my bosom, and your heart of worship will once again captivate my heart, and my spirit will be poured out upon you. The corn stalks are growing. Your prayers have captured my ears, and my arm is not too short. I will reach down, and I will touch the hardest of hearts. I will bring the hardest of situations forward to a thing of the past. Children will hear the word of the Lord and will become my trumpets in the land. Voice, you say, my voice will be heard among the congregation with unity. Unity like never before. When first assembly, be healed in Jesus' name. For the wounds of the past have caused you to bleed out, but now my hand of restoration has swept across you with the rays of light and the wind from my movement has covered you with my compassion. I saw this happening, the hand of God sweeping over this congregation. The breath of life will come from your lungs as you breathe and worship my name. Forget the traditions of man and enter into the new wine of my wineskins. Worship the Lord of hosts. Worship is your war cry against the enemy. I have not forgotten you. I have seen you. I have heard your cries. And now release of my Holy Spirit has been decreed from your lips. And I have answered with fire. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Amen. Amen. I believe God wants to answer by fire. When I 
read that last night as I was getting ready to go to bed, I was like, oh, God is doing something. Will you stand with me all across this auditorium? The devil has fought every moment this morning to keep this from happening today. That's why I sent out that message this morning. Don't let the devil keep you from the house of the Lord because your victory is here. I don't know about you, but I've gone through the fire. I've gone through the crucible moments. And I'm going to let my worship rise. And I'm going to touch the face of God. And I'm going to do exactly what that word says. Let my worship go to a whole other level so that it can touch the face of God. And that God will answer by fire. Church, this is what I want us to do. I want you to come. And if God has saw you through a crucible moment, saw you through trials, saw you through troubles, saw you through tribulation, I want you to turn the pain and the struggle of that time into praise, into worship, and create a threshing floor, an altar before the Lord. And I want you to let God, let the holy fire of God to fall on your life. Will you do that? Will you step right from where you're at, come to this altar, and stand and, and or kneel and just lift your hands and begin to worship Him as, as Miss Renee's playing this song and just begin to go after God. You don't need anybody singing. Just let praise flow from your hearts. Come on, church. Father, we, we ask for the fire of God. We ask for the fire of God. Oh, Lord, send the power, oh God. Send the power in this place. Fire the Holy Spirit.
beside you, would you begin to pray for them? Would you begin to pray that the power of the Holy Spirit begin to move in their lives? Will you, will you pray fire down on them? Come on, will you pray for unity in the body? Would you pray for a unity in the Word? Will you pray for unity in worship? Come on, pray for your neighbor. Pray the fire of God down on them. Because Sananamase, because Sananamase Teolo will say, Jesus, 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 Jesus.
Hallelujah. Come on, thank Him for the Word today. Thank Him for the supernatural gifts of the Spirit in operation in this house today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for speaking to me. Thank you for speaking to God. But oh, my friend, she's experiencing that presence in a whole different way now. Will you, will you just join me now as we pray for the family, that God would give them comfort uh, in this time of, of grieving? Will you pray with me? Father, we lift up Kay's family to you. Lord, we don't mourn in sorrow after Kay like those who have no hope for, Lord, we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So, Father, we ask that you would give every member of Trey's fa- uh, every K's family, Lord God, Trey and April and everybody else, oh God, give them peace, give them strength, give them comfort in this season of loss. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make yourself real to them, oh God. Lord, I pray that you would bless them, strengthen them, comfort them, I pray. Oh, God, I pray that the same glory that Kay is experiencing today, that we will continue to see a glimpse of it here on this earth. I pray, oh, God, that we glorify you. We glorify you. We glorify you. Touch them, we ask, right now in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm going to... I want to challenge you to be here tonight. The first Sunday nights of the month, we've we've designated, declared it a worship and prayer night. It's a service. It's not. It's not just something we're doing. It's it's a true service. But come ready to worship, like we've heard. But come ready to wage war through prayer and intercession. I, I'm heavy for what the enemy is trying to do in our community. Just this week, found out another who is, who has, like the scripture says, that has given up the natural ways of life to go with that which is unnatural. And this spirit of homosexuality and lesbianism is is ramping up in our community. And guess what? It's time for the church to stand up. And to say, it shall not. And it will not touch our kids. And the only way that we could do that is to plow deep into the ground and hit the wells of the Holy Spirit and let it. Listen, how can someone go away unless they've experienced the power of the Holy Spirit? The true supernatural experience. So I challenge you tonight, come. So that we can dig some wells so that we can drink from and that our kids can drink from, so that they will taste the supernatural. How many is glad that you came to church today? Amen. How many is glad you're not going to let the devil have any kind of victory in your life? Father, I thank you for your people. Ah, I thank you for your people. Their heart to follow after you. I pray, God, that you would bless them. Many are tired from travel and the, the activities of the week. I pray that this will be a day of rest for them. That they'll have rest in their mind, their body, and their spirit. Bring us back safe tonight that we can worship you and in spirit and truth. And Father, we love you and we give you the praise, the glory, and all of the honor. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hug your neighbor's neck. Let them know you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord this morning. God bless you. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock.